Hi, good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone from around the world. From China, from Italy, from Bangkok, Philippines, Germany, Bangladesh, Brazil, Austria, Australia, Greece, Vietnam, and India. Welcome all of you. We are so glad you are here with us today at CHC Training Academy webinar under the series of 2021 Health and Wellness Will Be Different. So as always, while listening to our webinar, we would like to encourage you to think about these four questions. What excites you while listening? What concerns you? What do you want to know more about? What ideas you have while listening? We will have Q&A at the end of the session. So please drop your questions in the chat box. We will ask your, your questions at the end of the session. And today's topic is about change and collaboration. We are very honored and excited to have Trevor Gore, a senior advisor and facilitator of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy and a founder of Mestro Consulting. Trevor has a very seasoned experience in consumer healthcare industry. With over 20 years of experience in training, helping organizations developing brands to people development, combined with his passion for self-care and healthcare, he is one of the most sought speakers and trainers in our healthcare industry. And let me also introduce you to our moderator of the day, the one and only, Dave McCarken with over 30 years of rich experience in globally known advertising and communication companies, leading Asia Pacific strategy planning, insights and market research for many famous brands. Dev is one of the most thought experts when it comes to insights, understanding consumer behavior and brands. Over to you, Dev and Trevor. Thank you very much and it's great to be here uh, today or this evening or wherever you are and whatever time it is. It's a great subject. Uh, Trevor and I have done a few background discussions. I guess, Trevor, it would be fair to say that between us, we probably have nearly 100 years of change and collaboration with brands. And uh, we're going to try to cover some of that today. So, Trevor, do you want to get started? Yeah, thanks a lot, Dave. Um, so, uh, AIM very kindly uh, set me up. Um, a little bit about me, where I come from. I started in community pharmacy back in when Noah was a small boy. And um, strange things happened when I worked in pharmacy. I saw these reps coming in from all these companies with their sharp suits and their nice cars and telling me they sort of left home at eight o'clock in the morning and they were always home by four o'clock in the afternoon. And I thought, why am I working eight o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night in a pharmacy? And they've got this easy life. So I left. And I joined what was a small company, um, Merrill Dow, and I became Marion Merrill Dow, then it became Hertz Marion Roussel. And I started off as a salesman, then a sales trainer. And I, I got hooked on why people don't do what we want them to do. We've, we've all experienced it. We send the rep out with our wonderful graphs and our wonderful data that says product A is better than product B. And the doc says, yeah, but I've been dealing with product A for 20 years. I'm not changing now. So I thought, why don't people change when the overwhelming evidence is there that they should? And then I looked at my own life. You'll be pleased to know the camera's only catching my top half, but I'm a, I'm a, a rotund fellow. And I know eating what I eat is bad for me. I'm also type 2 diabetic, but I don't change. So I started getting interested in psychology. And then I, after about 10, 11 years, I left Merrill and joined a small company called Reckitt & Coleman. That became Reckitt Ben Kaiser and RB. And I continued my studies. I got a degree in behavioral psychology, but I still had the same problem. Why, when I'm telling perfectly rational healthcare professionals what they should be doing, they don't listen. And I worked my way up through um, RB and I finished as the global healthcare pharmacy training manager. And then five years ago, I left. I thought I've, I've got to do more on this change because it fascinates me. Uh, in the meantime, I was awarded honorary membership of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in the UK and uh, an outstanding contribution to the OTC industry. So I've lived my entire life for understanding change and OTC brands. And then a year ago, I joined the Institute for Collaborative Working to understand how we can work better together 
And at the beginning of this year, I was made uh, and voted on to the advisory council for the Institute of Collaborative Working. That's enough about me. I'm passionate about brands. I'm passionate about healthcare. And I'm really passionate about change, which is what we're going to be talking about. So Trevor, so just before you start, let me just remind the people that are viewing or will be viewing when they watch the downloaded video. What we're going to do is uh, Trevor's going to take us through his thoughts over the next 50 minutes to an hour. He and I will share his thoughts. I'm going to be asking some questions and maybe throwing in a few examples of my own of some of the, the great ideas he has. Uh, and then we'll be answering questions. So you can uh, deposit questions in the Q&A uh, tab down below or put them in the chat section down below on your screen as we go along and we will get to them towards the end of the session. Okay, off you go. Thanks for that, Dave. And your questions will all, and your examples particularly will be really good because a lot of mine will be Eurocentric and I know you have extreme experience in lots of other markets. So they'll be really interesting. Um, we're at a time of confusion. Um, anybody who thinks the world hasn't changed, hasn't been paying attention. Um, and if and when we come out of the, this COVID pandemic, will the new normal, which is a phrase I dislike, uh, will show us what has changed. Uh, but it has changed. Um, so we'll look at why we need to change, what's changed in our marketplace, what change does to people. Um, a lot of people resist change and we need to understand why shouting at people doesn't make them change. And I think that's a mistake we've made in the healthcare industry, that if I shout at a doctor or a pharmacist long enough, show him enough wonderful graphs why my product is better than another product, they'll change. We know deep down that doesn't work. Um, I'll introduce something called a combi system and then we'll go into collaboration and where the two overlap. So we're all familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs and uh, it's been around for a best part of a century now and talk of you know your survival needs need to be met before your security needs and your social needs. But there's a thing that's changed in this now. Everyone thought that was static, but there's a need that pre underscores survival uh, and that's Wi-Fi. And I think this pandemic has proven more than anything that we're all reliant on Wi-Fi. When, when I go to conferences, when I go to hotels and I'm queuing to check in, um, the first question people ask is, can I have the Wi-Fi code? Yeah. Not where's my room or where's the conference, is, is there a Wi-Fi code? And I think the ability to get online, the fact we're doing this, this webinar today is, is a testament to how Wi-Fi has and is changing the world. Just think Dave. about it, Trevor. I guarantee you all the people watching this are doing it on with two screens going. They're watching us on one screen and they're playing around on this thing on another because you can't do everything without anything without it, right? So it is what it is. Absolutely. It's, it's the way the world has gone. Uh, we're in a great industry uh, in consumer healthcare. Uh, we're trusted. Over-the-counter medicines and health supplements are trusted. And I just, this is a, a blatant plug um, for self-care day, which is a, a week today. Um, and the move to self-care is evidence, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, our friends at Arcubia did a survey recently for the industry and said, what are the greatest business priorities? And by far and away, number one was the changes in consumer behavior. And so that's why we decided to look at why change is important. Number two was collaboration. So these fell in very nicely to what we wanted to talk about anyway. I said I'd wanted to talk about change for quite some time. Um, not only are, are consumers changing, but societies are changing. They're looking now to work with different organizations. They don't want organizations whose sole raise on debt is profit. They're looking to work with organizations that have a purpose in life beyond profit. They understand profits and necessity to keep your business going, but they choose to interact with, with brands and with companies that have a real purpose in life. And we'll come on right at the end to what, what's driving some of these purposes. But remember climate change. The world is listening to a 17 year old. She was 40 when she started uh, her protest. But the world is listening to her and it's about climate change and purpose. Um, we've got the Black Lives Matter and in the UK, we, um, slavery is, has become a big issue. And people are looking at where they buy their clothes from now. Because the World Health Organization reckons there are about 24 million people still in economic slavery. And we know just down the road from me in Leicester, there are clothing factories that were paying people three pound an hour. And this is beginning to impact brands that are walk away from that's how their clothes are made and people looking at the supply chain. So the purpose is becoming a real issue for a great many consumers. Also from controlling 
patriarchal way, especially in healthcare. Gone are the days that you went in, you saw the doctor, he told you what to do, and you went away and did it. People are now empowered. Um, some healthcare professionals don't like this. And um, Dr. Google, when you Google your symptoms, you run into the doctors and say, I have a brain hemorrhage. And he sits you down, sighs, asks a few questions, says, no, you have a headache is what you've got. Um, so people want to be more empowered and they're looking for transparency as well. So the way work, the way business, the way brands appear now is actually becoming more important than people are doing research to see what they're going to put in their body, where it comes from, what's the ethos behind the company. Self-care, <clears throat> the whole healthcare system is, is a, a spectrum. Starts on the left-hand side where it's lifestyle, and a lot of people are moving into that. It's vitamins, it's yoga, and then there's the inter interdependent where they're looking for advice from pharmacists, from doctors, right to the far side where it's managed care, you're in hospital and they're doing it. But people are trying to prevent themselves from getting into the healthcare system. They want to treat themselves, serve themselves. So they're looking for information, um, vitamins and minerals, especially people are saying what does. Although I saw a survey recently that said for the majority of people in the developed world, there is no need for vitamins if they've got a reasonable, healthy diet. So, you know, okay, people so are looking. They will still up the ante anyway. Right? So. It doesn't matter, my experience of working in the vitamin industry was, it doesn't matter how much people have through natural intake of food and beverages, et cetera, they'll also always think they need more than they actually are taking in for some reason. Right? It's just, and I think probably the COVID times we live in actually accentuate all of that, doesn't it? I mean, all across that spectrum, people are trying to find out more, live more well, be prepared more, avoid the big the big health risk in some way right? so it's a constantly moving exploding uh, wealth of information that means we want to change ourselves absolutely people 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 are now interested in their health i think they always were is i think the healthcare system treated like they shouldn't be i think the healthcare system said we're the experts you're not shut up and listen and people just aren't willing to stand for that anymore well an interesting example of that is if you think about grandmother soup right so you know in in in, um, in china or greater china the chinese greater world uh, we've seen this explosion with uh, tcm chinese traditional medicines uh chinese traditional remedies that have been modernized in some way and it's really interesting how the young populations of china are now getting a real interest in things that probably 20 years ago were totally unfashionable because no no that's what my, your grandmother did in those primitive old days now it's, oh yeah, maybe there was a point to that. Maybe there was something behind that. And I remember seeing a survey a few years ago I worked on where across Asia, where one of the things when we talked about wellness that was most popular was, how do we get that really terrible tasting thing that grandma used to make, but put it in a pill so it was easy to take? Because it was that, you know, I want to take care of myself, I think there probably is a lot of stuff going on in my family and in my tradition. I just want it in a modern lifestyle and packaging, those sorts of things. It's really interesting, Dave. The, the grandma's soup and when you're ill, take your chicken soup. It's a probiotic. Yeah. That's what it actually is. It's just a probiotic. And as you say, we've, we now manufacture them in capsules and all that. I, grandma usually knew best. Um, some of the bigger chains uh, are catching on to this um, need for understanding of what's going on around CVS in the States. They've rolled out 80 health and exclusive wellness products. So they talk about sustainably sourced bamboo for their toothbrushes, sustainably sourced fish oils caught without harm to the fish. I don't know how you don't harm the fish if you've caught it, but there you go. But healthy marine brand. So uh, companies are now putting front and center their environmental credentials on this is why my brand's better. Because the reality is, and, and I apologize if this offends all our listeners, is the vast majority of us are working on the same set of ingredients. We're just trying to find a way to make our ingredients stick out. And, and I saw a survey recently that says you can probably charge 15% more if you can truly claim some environmental benefits. Mm -hmm. So people are willing to pay the price. Mm -hmm. This terrified me. 
Um, it's for Western Europe, but I suspect there's some truth in the rest of the world. This was by Havis, that 77% of the content by healthcare brands isn't meaningful. And we'll come on to what they found out was meaningful. And, and to be brutally honest, I think this COVID crisis has made the consumer healthcare industry sit up because I don't think we've been serving our consumers particularly well over the last three or four years. I think they've been ahead of us. They've adopted digital and we're still catching up on digital. Again, I saw a survey the other day that said nearly 50% of companies have decided because of the COVID crisis, they need to be having a digital offering. Well, where have you been for the last five years when our consumers have been asking that question? You know, what's your digital offering? Well, to that point, I think we talked about this the other day, but um, I was reminded yesterday when I was talking to a, a, a client about something and I said to them, but I'm pretty sure when I read your company's Wikipedia entry about your brand, that it said X. And the marketing director for this company said, do we have a Wikipedia entry? Uh, so. Oh, it's terrifying. Yeah. We're all really familiar with the, with the consumer decision-making process, the journey. I think it has stood as well in the past. But again, over the last two or three years, I think we've let consumers down. Um, one thing is we've been obsessed with touch points. So we've made sure each touch point is good. But if you get 80% consumer satisfaction on each touch point, that means you've got less than 50% consumer satisfaction with the journey. Mm. So you're upsetting or not delivering for half because you focus on each one. I think we should look at it as a complete journey because the consumers do. They don't think, right, I'm in advertising mode. They just, this is all part of my life. This is what I do. And there's bits in there, the information sources, pharmacists, doctors, and the point of sale in pharmacy. And when you go in and ask some questions in pharmacy, which I label the sales prevention officers, because we've sold our drug in, our, our solution in at a higher level to head office or to the chief pharmacist. And then the poor assistant, the counter assistant, or the day-to-day -day pharmacist doesn't know a great deal about it. So you go in and ask for Nurofen, and they say, no, you don't want Nurofen, you want ibuprofen. It's the same ingredient, but it's a third of the size. No understanding of brand values and just looking at ingredients. I always say you can tell a real person from a pharmacist. A real person will pick up a pack and look at it and says, this is for cold, sore throat. A pharmacist will pick it up and turn it over and say, these are the ingredients. This is what's important to me. And that's not true for consumers. The other thing is, you'll see uh, on, the th on the screen, is it's a loop. We follow them through. Every other interaction I have, whether it's online or with real people, closes the loop. But pharmacy and healthcare doesn't. Most healthcare professionals other than pharmacists do. When I go and have my eyes tested, when I go and have my diabetes monitored, the last thing the optician or my dentist or my doctor says to me is, that should solve the problem, but if it doesn't, come back and see me. The last thing my pharmacist says when I go and pick up my medicine or go and buy a self-care remedy is, would you like a bag? When I go online, Amazon say, you bought this, other people are buying this. How satisfied were you with your purchase? Doesn't happen in pharmacy, doesn't happen in self-care generally. We just say, right, well, the end game is you bought our product. It so isn't. We should be part of the consumer's life. Dave, you were mentioning something the other day about uh, this. Yeah, I mean, it's a common fact. I think it's a common fact in more industries than we sometimes realize. You know, a lot of industries, as you say, don't do the right follow up. Um, now, I think part of that, if you take the pharmacists, of course, most of us, people your age, my age, are old enough to remember, you know, I grew up in a particular suburb in Sydney. There was one pharmacy, he knew everybody in the suburb. He'd stop and wave it, talk to my mother on the footpath. He'd ask about how my dad was doing at work, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the world's changed like that. And so we don't normally have those circumstances. So in the course of that, we've lost that, um, that continual feeling and that continual involvement in people's lives. And so what we do see is that most organisations, as you point out, don't do the follow-up. They don't do the thinking about um, reminding you of, are you feeling better? Could I be doing something else? I mean, I always give the example of when you go on a vacation with, uh, you know, with an airline, uh, the airline never gets back to you six months later and says, hey, you know, how was your trip to Barbados? Was it really good? Have you thought about going back again? 
Um, Amazon does that. That's why they're the world's biggest retailer. Um, but, you know, day to day, most companies don't. And I love I loved the way you described sales prevention officers. Um, and I think if anybody listening to this, just write down that term, sales prevention officer, and have a think about that. Because I think if we get nothing else out of this hour, that itself is something that you should be thinking about. Oh, how do we change that? What do we do about that? You know, because um, it really is. It's a. It's that. Let's just stop now. You know, let's. I, I, that's all I'm going to do for you. See you later. You know, and it's not really building sales over time or building relationships. Which, funnily enough, all the marketing textbooks say that's what we're supposed to be doing today, right? Is relationship building. But I'm not seeing that necessarily in the pharmacist world. Thanks, Dave. We are part of the problem in the industry. As I said earlier, we're playing with a limited number of ingredients. So we're just saying we're bigger, we're better, we're faster. Um, it's not really working for consumers. That I don't know if any of you read the paradox of choice. Is too much choice makes a decision harder to make, not easier. We've all been to restaurants where it was a 62-page um, menu. And what do you do? You either say, no, I'm not eating here, or you eat what you had last time. You don't experiment, you don't try anything new. I think in healthcare, health and beauty, one of the biggest offenders is the, the toothpaste industry. I go and look there and there's 15 new ones that treat everything known to man. And what do I buy? I buy the one I've been buying for five years because I know it does what it says it's going to do. I know, Dave, you worked in the uh, oral hygiene industry for a while. I've, I've managed somehow to spend most of my professional career always having toothpaste wine. And, you know, if you go into the, the supermarket nearest to where I live, last time I checked, there were 97 brands of toothpaste on the shelf. Now, what was interesting about the toothpaste category was that for a long while, the perception was that toothpaste were all about basically anti-cavity, just prevention of cavities. The problem is that if you have one or two brands on the market, they can get away with that. But when everybody's trying to get into that, everybody's just saying, well, we're about stopping cavities. We're about stopping cavities. We're about stopping cavities. You can't break through. And it wasn't until a few brands a few decades ago started to understand that actually oral care wasn't necessarily just about anti-cavity. One of the most famous ones um, uh, was when brands started to realize that quite often people were brushing their teeth not to stop cavities, but to make themselves prettier, to make themselves more kissable. And so close up from Unilever, for example, was significant because they got onto this very early. They learned from the Wrigley chewing gum example that, oh, fresh breath meant that now somebody was more likely to kiss me if I got close enough to them. So brush your teeth to get the kiss. Well, that was a dramatic change, right? And it's differentiated. And then we've seen other brands now do all sorts of interesting things in differentiating, not just by the ingredients, but by, if you like, what the purpose of the toothpaste is, uh, why you're brushing your teeth, what are you trying to get out of it? Um, and that is a typical example of how you have to differentiate to actually stand out. Not think inside the category, but think out, as you pointed out right at the beginning, what is it that people as consumers really want in life? Uh, well, as a consumer, you know, as a young guy, for example, I like the idea of getting kissed, right? So, you know, do I, am I brushing my teeth with the right thing that meant that I was presentable and people would want to do it? Well, maybe I'll go that way. And those sorts of things and categories that make the difference. As you point out, choices are horrendous. People don't like choice. What they like is easy answers. So give them answers that suit what their lifestyle ambition is or what they want to get out of life. When is enough enough? Yeah. Like a slide. Um, when we segment, and I hope we all are segmenting, no product is for everybody. Um, it has stood us in good stead looking at aging populations that absolutely are populations around the world are aging but I think we rely too much on demographics because the world is it's all about change so the world is changing so you might be pregnant at 18 or you might be pregnant at 50 are your needs the same certainly you may need more but just saying oh this is for 18 year olds who might be pregnant 
Um, also, if this pandemic's told us anything, a lot of people have moved back into their parental home. A lot of people around the world have never left their parental home until their mid thirties. Who do you think buys the medicine? Suddenly your consumer and your shopper are very different people. A mother's buying for adult sons and daughters who cannot afford to leave home. What is your marketing saying to who? You know, I'm a type two diabetic. Um, and when I studied pharmacy those 3000 years ago, um, it was called maturity onset diabetes because it was old fat men that got it. Um, we now see around the world 20, 30 year olds suffering from it. It's the same condition. They need the same treatments. So our, our broad demographic uh, categories, I think we need to look at and start thinking more about people's life stages and, and connected health and technology. The, the, the prevailing wisdom, and I think it, it is wrong, and I think it always was wrong, is that these old people don't get technology. I thought they got it particularly well, and I think this COVID has showed more than anything. They're the ones who are on Zoom having meetings with their grandchildren around the world. They get it perfectly well. They may halt, be too near the camera or too far away. They may not get the, the intricacies or the nices of it, but they're using it. They're the ones that have demanded and manufacturers are responding with mobile phones that just make calls or do texts because that's what they want to do with them. Dave, I know you've done a lot of work on this. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the misconceptions about aging population is you talk forever. But you're perfectly right in terms of, in most markets of the world, um, the perception when I talk to marketers is, oh, anybody over 60, well, don't sell to them because A, they don't buy stuff, they're not going to live long, they don't try new things, and we can't reach them because they don't know how to use technology. Well, the latter point, all of those are untrue. The latter point, of course, is insane because if you're a marketer and you have a target market that can't use a particular technology, that's your problem, not theirs. You find a technology you can reach them with. But you're also correct in terms of the misconception that people over 60 can't use technology. Well, you know, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, amongst others, have done many studies that indicate that the population that is now roughly to 60 to 75 is the most technologically adapt generation in the history of mankind, simply because they lived through a period where more changing technology happened in daily life than any other. By the way, MIT also points out that anybody under roughly 26, 27 has never really had to adapt to major new technologies because there hasn't been a major new lifestyle technology for a quarter of a century. Mobile phones, over 25 years old. The way we use computers, over 25 years old. Video conferencing, over 25 years old. We, the generation that are now 60 to 75, are the quick learners. Um, and they will adapt to it. And they will find ways to use these things. So misconceptions everywhere about aging population, but about populations in general. And I think you make a good point right at the beginning, that demographics is way too simplistic a way to, to think about target markets and the way in which we talk to them or what messaging we want to give them. Thanks, Dave. Um, so the consumer moved on some time ago and they've become proactive. And I'm afraid as, a, as an industry, we've become rather reactive. We aren't leading the consumer, we're following them and some years behind them, if we're even following them. You know, they're making their own decisions. I, I, I've had an Apple watch for God knows how many years, but I, have, I had a bit been banned before that. It didn't affect what I did with my body, uh, but I've been monitoring how I'm falling apart for a great many years. So that's why we need to change. That's, those are the pressures within the industry, outside the industry, that are forcing our consumers to change. So now a bit about change theories, processes. Uh, whenever I ask who wants change, everybody put their hands up. The fact you've logged on to this wonderful webinar is you have some interest in change. That's why you're here. When I ask who wants to change, it goes a bit quiet. And then when I ask who wants to lead the change, I find I'm the only one in the room. And so I always say the only person who likes change is a wet baby. Nobody really likes change because we're comfortable in where we are. And we have to be dragged kicking and screaming sometimes. And that's why we frequently have people are scared of change. I think some people are scared of change, but we'll, we'll look a minute of what is actually going on behind that, because there are, are significant psychological processes going on behind that. So the effect on change on performance, I love this graph because there's, there's two truths, there's a lot of truths in it, but there's two big ones. Firstly, you have the old status quo, the old way of doing things, the old results. And then the new 
managing director comes in and says, we need to change. We know real reason why, but that's his job, to change things. So he comes in, introduces the new foreign element, this change. Chaos ensues. Um, the idea then gets adapted. It's integrated into the business. And you end up with a new status quo. And you'll notice that's at a higher level of performance, the old one. That's the ideal. The reality is when you're getting into the transforming idea, the integration and practice, the managing director's change, and the new one comes in and says, we need change. And he introduces another foreign element before you've got to the new status quo. So you spend a lot of time in chaos, transforming ideas. And just when you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, there's another bout of change comes your way and you go back into chaos because you haven't implemented the old one yet. So absolutely look, change is, necess is a necessity, um, but look at what it does to performance. Another way of looking at it is the process of change. Many of you will see this. Um, you start off with certainty about what you're doing and then somebody says, we're going to do this new thing and pessimism comes in and then you get to the valley of doom where all hope is lost. But then you come up the other side and then something goes wrong and you go back into doubt. No, this isn't going to work. And you can get stuck in that circle for quite a long time before you go up to confidence and satisfactory. And yet I can make this change work. And we'll look at some of the reasons for that. And then finally, there's uh, Prakashas and Di Clemente's cycle of change, which is used a lot in healthcare. So you have to be, you start off pre-contemplative. I don't want to change. I don't need to change. I'm not changing. Think about this, whether it's smoking, cessation or dieting or any process within your business. There will be a lot of people who say, thank you, but not here. We don't need to change. And then there's, OK, look, I'm aware there's a problem with my weight. I'm aware there's a problem with my dieting. Um, I, I really do need to think about changing. But nothing you do at the pre-contemplative or the contemplation stage will really affect me because I'm not really there. Then there's preparation. No, I'm going to change. I'm going to stop smoking. And everybody who decides they're going to stop smoking, everybody who decides, like myself, decides who they're going to diet, the first thing we do is we set an arbitrary date in the future. So I'm going to start my diet on Monday, or I'm going to start my diet on the 1st of July, or we set an arbitrary a bit in the future. And then on the last day of our old life, we go berserk. I eat everything in the fridge the day before my diet starts. Smokers will smoke. They won't leave half a packet of cigarettes. They'll smoke the whole bloody pack of cigarettes just so they can start the new day of I have no cigarettes in the house. Then they get to action, they do the smoking cessation, they have the patches, I eat sensibly, and I maintain this and that is now my habit. However, most people relapse. Um, when you worked on smoking cessation, most companies reckon between seven and nine times you'll fail and you'll become a smoker again. And I, I yo-yo diet all the time, as do most people do. That isn't a reason to give up. What you should do when you relapse is then go back into preparation for the change, not go back into pre-contemplation that says, oh, I'm not bothered. So I, I do that when my diet fails. The sensible thing, the psychological thing I know would be, well, my diet went wrong today. I'll start it again tomorrow. I don't. I say, well, that's this week ruined, which is really July out the way. So I'll start again in August. But I'm still in contemplation and preparation. I haven't gone right back so I don't need to change. That's a cycle of change. And when we're talking to healthcare professionals, whether it's doctors or pharmacists, remember they've been doing what they've been doing for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. The other thing is, largely healthcare professionals have served a community for their entire working life. They're the, as Dave mentioned, they, we remember the old days when you went into the pharmacist. Uh, he knew you, he brought you into the world and the doctor brought you and your mother into the world. So they, They've been practicing in this area um, and with a community for 30, 40 years. We send a new rep in with his wonderful detail that the marketing department has spent thousands on and expect after two minutes of him pretending to pay attention, but not really, nodding enthusiastically because remember they're taught to be empathetic. That's part of healthcare training. Yes, it's very interesting. Thank you. I'll give that some thought. And in your heart of hearts, you know that material went into the bin as you were leaving the surgery or the pharmacy, because we're just shouting at them. We're basically saying, doctor, you've been doing this for 40 years. Let me tell you why you're wrong. Do you think that's a welcoming message to hear from a rep they've never met before? So planning for change. Firstly, is there a business case? I have seen literally over the last three, four months in COVID, hundreds of webinars and companies saying, 
right, we're going to have a Facebook page. Uh, we're going to have Instagram. We're going to have all these digital assets because that's not made a business case for it. What is it they're doing? Why do they want a Facebook page? And I'll come on to some of those on. I know David will because there's a bugbear of his as well, I know. But there has to be a case in business for the change you want to make. And then you need people within the business in all sorts of roles to be bought into it. So you need a coalition of yeah, this is the right thing. And then you need other stakeholders. There's no point if your business has sat there and said, oh, we want to change what we sell to pharmacy. We want to do this very differently to pharmacists. If you haven't talked to pharmacists, you might say, yeah, that's not going to work for us. I remember a great case in the UK um, where I, I'll, I'll anonymize them. A large, um, one of the largest healthcare uh, pharma companies in the world decided they were going to change the terms for pharmacists. They were going to um, only supply through a certain wholesaler and the pharmacist could like it or lump it. Well, nobody spoke to the pharmacist about that until it was said, here it is, you've got to buy our products from this wholesaler at this price. Not a lot you can do about it. Yeah, there is. Um, nearly 80% of the pharmacists in the UK stop stocking this company's OTC brand because it was all the choice. They may not have had a choice on the prescription, but by God, they had a choice on the OTC brands and delisted them because they weren't brought into the process of why the change was needed and what the benefit to them was. They were just given it as a fait accompli. And that's where most change programs fail. People are told, this is the change, do it without any rationale behind it. Uh, communication should be relevant. It says timely and targeted. They should be relevant. You don't give the same detail to somebody in the office floor as you do to the C-suite, but they need to know what, how it's going to affect them and why they're doing it. So you make the conversation relevant and targeted. Um, in my role at the Institute of Collaborative Working, I, we talk a lot about leadership and collaboration. And whilst that's really important, it's the workers on the ground floor that will screw you up every single time. You may have a great direction. It's the same for all change. Um, the top may have a vision of where they want to go, but if the people working lower down don't, they will sabotage you, and I will come on to them later. And measure and fine tune, what are your KPIs? Are they real KPIs that show you're doing a good job and moving the business forward, or are they vanity? You know, why do people care about Facebook Live, really, as a business? I know Kim Kardashian does, and apparently Donald Trump does, but in the real world of business, what does it matter? And then finally evaluate what you said you were going to do. And one of the great things about digital is we can fall fast and fall forward. Try it. If it doesn't work, re-engineer it. David, I know it's one of your precious subjects. Oh, you're perfectly correct. I mean, the, the thing of Facebook, for example, I'm not picking on Facebook, but people measure the wrong things. They measure the stuff that's easily measured, but not necessarily the things that will make a difference. Um, you know, social media monitoring is a measurement of relative popularity compared to other things that are popular that have that are being measured it's not actually a measure of whether you're being effective um, and quite often i find that the evaluation process is we're evaluating against the things that we thought were easy to measure not necessarily the things that were really going to make a real difference to our business um, and so we see a lot of those gaps. Of course, because of a lot of sessions like this, you know, lots of the audience for this session will watch a lot of webinars, a lot of seminars, they'll read a lot of marketing press. And one of the problems is that the, the marketing industry keeps on pushing the idea of measuring things that are easily measured um, and uh, awarding prizes for that, which always surprises me, you know. Um, We've got to sort of break that, that cycle, if you like. And it sadly is a cycle. Yeah. It just keeps going round and round and vanity and stupid measures. And again, awarding themselves for it. And next year, they fight to win the award again for stupidity. Oh, unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Why don't I have control? Give me control. Thank you. The equation for change. As many of you might have seen this. I love this because it tells you what you need to have in place for change to happen. You need the vision of what it is you're aiming for, the skills to make sure you can get it, an incentive to make sure people's behaviours recognize, are recognised for driving it, the resources to make it happen, 
and an individualized action plan. And I, I'll be rude, I hope there's not too many people on here from the UK, but if I look at the UK government's approach to the COVID crisis, you can see each one of those at various times during it wasn't followed and what happened. So there was no vision at the beginning. So everyone was confused. What the hell do I do? And then when suddenly the resources aren't there, people are frustrated. Well, I can't do this because you won't do that. And then the action plan is changing all over the time. So people are in lockdown. People aren't in lockdown. Um, as it stands at the moment in the UK, I can go to a pub locally where I will sit down with people a bit isolated, but, you know, within the group don't need to wear a mask and I can sit there for four or five hours and drink. Going forward from next week, if I go to the local supermarket where I'll be brushing past people quickly and not sitting with them for four hours, I have to wear a mask. So the action plans keep getting changed, which means people are confused and you have false starts and it, it starts up again. And the, the UK government, in my opinion, have been particularly poor at it, but that you've seen this around the world with governments that change what the action plan is and the vision. And people just don't know where the hell they're going to on it. Yeah. Why am I working? My, my controller's gone again. Thank you. Um, so why would people resist change? People often say the reason people resist change is fear. And that's towards the end of the process. The first reason people resist change is they don't see there's a problem. It's not they're scared of a problem. They're oblivious to the problem. I don't see there's a problem. Then people move into, okay, I see the problem, but I don't know what the solution would look like. So now I'm anxious, I'm not scared. And then, then you get to, something's going horribly wrong with this computer. I apologize, stop it. Um, then you get people, they see the problem, they see your proposed solution, but they don't agree with it. They're now in anger mode. And then finally, some people see the problem, they see the solution, but they're scared of the consequences. And that's when the fear kicks in. So it's not necessarily fear, it's anxiety, it's uh, obliviousness. And our task as managers, as leaders, is to get them to openly talk about their concerns. Where are they on, on that spectrum? Because everyone just says, oh, people are scared of change. Not necessarily. They might just be oblivious to the need to change. So as leaders, we need to talk our people through change. Uh, I'm not going to talk about COMB, which is a system that's used extensively in healthcare, but I found it works in a lot of business settings as well. So, and it works with our healthcare professionals, and I'll tell you what we, as the industry, are very good and very bad at doing. Um, so B is the behavior, what I want to see. And so firstly, we have to make sure people have the capability to change. And we, are they psychologically and physically able to do what we want them to do? So if I want them to, to reckon, uh, recommend my brand A, um, can they do it? Have they got the psychological and physiological ability? Can they speak? Yes. Um, do we stock it? Yeah, great. Then the O, do they have the physical and social environment that enables this recommendation, this change? Um, do they see customers with this condition? Are they allowed to talk to the customers? Are they allowed to recommend products? If they can do all them, we think we've done a good job. So we've put the product on shelf, we've told them about it, told them who to recommend it for, and that's the job done. But the biggest barrier to people changing their behavior is their motivation. And this is where we failed for many, many years talking to doctors, and why I first got interested in the psychology of this, is taking our wonderful detail aids to the doctor and saying, here it is, product A is better than product B, will you change? And they say, yeah, what motivation have you really given them to change? Because mm. I know, and if you're honest, you know, the rep from the competing company is half an hour behind you who will show another graph that's been manipulated to show theirs is the best product. And so, like we said earlier, the paradox of choice and change, what's a healthcare professional gonna do? What they always did, I'll stick with the product I've got and I'll stick with the product I know. And, and we, to David's point earlier, we keep congratulating and awarding ourselves prizes for the wrong business. Now, the prettiest detail aid. I don't give a flying stuff what your detail aid looks like. It does it do the job of moving people up the adoption ladder from never having heard of you to you're my preferred brand. That's what we should be looking at. Now there are lots of action levers. So when we look at ease, so we, if you look at, I'll go back a slide. If you look at capability and opportunity, that's let's make it easy for people to do the thing we want them to do. 
let's make it easy. So if you look at ease, you can give people the skills that they need to have for this new world. You can make it as easy as you possibly can. So eliminate all the complexity. So it makes the job easier. Uh, but an odd one people never look at is commitment. If people commit to doing something, there's all sorts of strange things happen. So Save the Children did a, a, a brilliant uh, research on this. So they did their normal adverts and their normal logical adverts were things like people in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa um, are dying. We need some money. Give us your money. And that's basically what Bob Geldof said. Give, give me your money. And, and people did. Then they got cleverer and did emotional advertising. Little Johnny down the road um, in Africa has to walk five miles with a bucket on his head for a horrible rancid water. Please do something to help. And that got significantly more response, significantly more income. And then they tried an action-based one, which was, would you like to sign up to our monthly newsletter? Would you like to wear the pin? Would you like to contribute? And people said, yeah, yeah, of course. And they said, can we have your contribution now, please? And more people did it because they'd committed to the action already. Uh, another one, a famous one in the States, and I love this one, there's a, a road that was extremely busy. It was a residential street and motorists used it as a rat run to get from one street to another. They sped down it. So they went down one side of the street and said, you know, you must be as worried as we are about the speeding. Can we ask you to put signs up in your garden that say drive carefully, reduce your speed? And 17% of people did. They then ran, went round to the other side of the street and said, um, we understand there's people speeding up and down here all the time. Will you sign our petition, please? to get the council to do something about it. People signed a petition and said, also, would you be willing to put a sign up in your garden that says drive carefully, slow down? And a massive 55% of people did it. It's partly due to something called cognitive dissonance. You can't sign a petition that says, I don't like people um, speeding. And then they say, well, are you prepared to do something about it? They say, no, not really. Um, so that's a real way within commitment, um, not motivation, that's just commitment to help people to see how they can be part of change. Would, would you be prepared to do this? And people are more likely to do it. The other one is motivation, and it's the most powerful one. And it's in some ways the hardest one, but um, there are about a hundred different motivational techniques. So going down that list, I'll talk about reframing in a second, but there's evocation, that scare the hell out of people. That's what smoking adverts used to do. Here's a dirty lung, we evoke a strong uh, feeling within you. Um, there's collectivism. This is what everybody else has done. That's why brands are really keen on trying to get a sentence, we are the number one because, or we are the number one. It's become overused. So it was great when you could say we are the number one painkiller. And now companies are resorting to we're the number one aspirin-based painkiller that's taken for migraines on a Wednesday. It, it's meaningless. But if we can point to a big group and say this is what they're doing and what they recommend. Ownership. Get people to tell you what they would do. That's a great motivational thing. If they say, well, I'll do it like this. And if that's feasible, let them. Um, play, um, gamification is everywhere now. If you can build it into an app, build the required behavior into a game, it's more quickly learned. Utility is giving everybody an app to do the thing. And, and modeling, we've used it in healthcare for ages, but we called it having a key opinion leader. This is what they say. It's modeling somebody who is believable and has credentials in this area. But reframing, I, I like because it's easy, it's powerful, and people don't know you did it. So a reframe is just changing what you call it. You don't change the thing at all. And um, one of the things we've seen in lockdown is some people love it, some people hate it. Um, and when the research has been looked at, it's people who suffer, and, and there are a lot of people, and I don't minimize it in any way, shape, or form, with depression it's how they framed the position those who say they are stuck at home suffer more depression and ill feeling than those people who have said i am safe at home and it's the mm -hmm. exactly the same circumstances you're in the house and not going out but the reframe has affected how you think about it um a great one uh is mcdonald's so you wouldn't normally give your child a highly sugar carbonated drink deep fried potatoes and uh, a vegetable uh, wrapped um, burger type thing. You wouldn't do that. But if I call it a happy meal, it suddenly becomes, yeah, that's, that's not so bad. I'll give my kids a happy meal. McDonald's are very good at doing this. 
um, they do, um, if you've ever, food is a great one for reframing to make it acceptable. If I asked you all at home if you've ever had a muffin for breakfast, most of you would say, yeah, I've had a muffin, chocolate muffin, blueberry muffin. If I said, have you ever had a cake for breakfast? Most of you go, well, no, why would you have a chocolate cake? That's unhealthy. A muffin's a cake. It's just been rebranded, reframed to be helpful. One of the most famous ones, though, for reframing, which I love, um, I'll come on to new and improve in a minute, is Diamond Shreddies. This was done in Canada, and they decided Shreddies, the, the breakfast cereal, was boring. So they launched new, exciting Diamond Shreddies. And they actually said, you know, our packs will contain both. Will you be lucky and get the new, exciting Shreddies instead of the old, boring Shreddies? Now, we laugh at that. We see it exactly for what it is. It isn't a change in the product at all. It's a change in nothing, except the reframe. Diamonds exciting, a square is boring. They're the same thing. But market share went up 80%. Now, we can say, well, people are stupid, and um, that's not for me to say. But it was an interesting reframe. The reframe for new improved, and I don't like new and improved. I like new, and I like improved. But you can't be both. If your product didn't exist before, you're new, so it couldn't have been improved. And if it did exist before and you've improved it, it's not new, it's a continuation. But we get that a lot in healthcare just to confuse people. Um, at the Healthcare Academy, Consumer Healthcare uh, Training Academy, we've been talking for years about Kuba to know, understand, believe, and act. And most of our messaging to our healthcare professionals is stuck on K. Do you know my product's better than everybody else? There's no real attempt to try to get them to understand what that means to them other than here's a graph there's never anything that says what's your belief system how do we tap into your belief system and it rarely uh, ends up in action um, i've been a field sales trainer and i was always amazed that most sales calls don't end up in an action other than will you buy some of my product which then say, i can say i can almost guarantee i can sell any product into any pharmacy in the world that's easy Next time I go there, it'll still be on the shelf. I was in a pharmacy once. Was there not? No, I won't tell you. Yes, I will. And I was talking to the pharmacist, and I became aware his line of sight had gone. He wasn't looking me in the eye anymore. He was looking down there. And I said, he said, excuse me, and he picked up this pack, blew the dust off, and said, look at this. Expired three years ago. Maureen, get me one more of these. It's expired. So, you know, he doesn't even believe or anything in the product. He hasn't sold one for three years, but he wants to buy another one. And this, this is automatic behavior. And this is what we do when we talk to our pharmacists. Brand A is better than brand B. Here's a graph that makes you believe it. It doesn't and will make you recommend it. It doesn't, never did. But we still stick with that paradigm. So coming to the chain, COVID has changed the world. Uh, the nice straight line we were going on was probably the wrong straight line, as we said, with digital, etc. cetera. Um, consumer behaviors have changed and we were behind the curve. But, you know, it's there but it's changed the road. It's put a curve in our wonderful straightforward road. That isn't a problem if we make the turn. The problem is if we keep going straight ahead and whenever, wherever you are, the COVID climate changes and some of the behaviors go back, we can go on what we always did. Some of the behaviors will go back, a lot won't. I think the idea that all the people who started shopping online will immediately revert to going into a store is fantasy. I think a large chunk of them will continue that's, to shop. That's not going to happen. Uh, we've seen the slow aggregation of online shopping over the last 20 years, slowly, slowly, slowly. The last six months has just dramatically sped up what was an eventuality of more people slowly experimenting and now being forced to experiment and going, let's go with it. So uh, you're perfectly correct. Online shopping is here to stay. So. And, and the impact that will have on pharmacy will be interesting because a lot of your, our efforts, I'm still in the industry, um, are based around activation in store. Yeah. Our wonderful point of sale materials, our banners. What if they're not seeing them? Yeah. So how do you activate them now? That's why the journey is so important and the feedback within the journey is so important rather than a touch point and we've got them. On to my second topic, collaboration. Um, Collaboration is interesting. Again, it's been in healthcare forever. But again, the COVID crisis has brought it to the fore where health companies are collaborating with governments, with each other. We have Pfizer down the road collaborating on can they get a, a COVID virus out there? Um, doctors collaborating with pharmacists now, nurses. So collaboration 
is now front and center, but it's always been there in healthcare, uh, and which is good because IQVIA said it's the second biggest challenge um, to the consumer healthcare industry after changes in consumer behavior. Uh, NICE uh, in the UK has uh, said it's the key to unlocking innovation, and it is. I don't know if you're on uh, one of these webinars a few weeks ago where Steve and Dave talked about blue oceans and red oceans. Blue oceans uh, are competitive. No, red oceans are competitive and blue oceans are collaborative and looking out. How much money do we as brands spend to no real avail? Cost, and our competitor down the road is spending just as much just to confuse the consumer. We don't grow the pot at all. And I'll talk a bit about uh, that a little minute. But collaboration is absolutely the key for patient health. And it goes back to the things I said right at the beginning. What are we about? What is our purpose? Is it about making money? or is it about improving the health of our communities? Uh, it's everywhere, you know, Teva and Procter and Gamble had one, a, a really good collaboration for a while, but everybody everywhere is now on the healthcare collaboration, which is very good. Problem is most people have either one or two views on collaboration. They either think it's nice and soft and fluffy and a group hug, let's all be nice to each other, or they think it's like synchronized swimming with the sharks, they're all out to get you. And that's because people have based their experience of collaboration on what's happened when they've tried to collaborate. They've either sat in a room where everyone said, well, we could do this, wouldn't that be nice? Or you've been shafted. So most group projects are meant to teach a teamwork, collaboration and communication, where in my experience, and I suspect in a lot of your experience, what they've actually taught you is not to trust anybody. Because the other people, I was talking to a very large player in the um, uh, health field, and um, they said, I was talking about this subject of collaboration, and they say we're very collaborative. Well, I've been on the opposite side of collaborating with them at my time at RB, and their version of collaboration is basically bend over and I'm going to collaborate you. And mm. it was you do what I say, what I do, because I want something from you. That isn't collaboration. Yeah. It really is. That's what most people's perception is. Either it's woolly and you don't get anything, or how can I get one over on the person I'm collaborating with? Just as we've talked about change early in the consumers have changed, business have changed over the years from being vertically integrated, being virtually integrated, and moving from a portfolio of products to a portfolio of relationships and the new network economy. And they're all based on collaboration. Those of you who have ticked the box that says, we really must get on and, and, and be digital, do you fondly imagine as a healthcare company, you have the capabilities to be digital without collaborating with somebody? Not just saying, oh, we'll get them to do it. That's not a collaboration, and I'll talk to you why. All collaborations are based on trust, and there are three types of trust uh, we have in business, and they're interesting, I find. So there's the trust of immediate relationships. That's the people you see every day sat in the opposite, of, used to be sat in the office opposite you, they're now sat on the screen on your wall. And there's the trust of your external partner, who you're going to partner with, do I trust them? If you don't, don't collaborate with them, really. Um, I find it really interesting that a lot of companies who, uh, even RB when I worked there, and I was always pushing to be able to work from home, I said, oh, we don't like it, and we argued with them, and I said, why not? And they said, we don't trust our people. And I said, well, firstly, why have you employed people you don't trust? But since it became a necessity, they've suddenly started trusting their people and everybody's working from home. I find that interesting, and I would question whether they trust them at all, or companies that behave like that, aren't putting measures in to see when you logged on, logged off, and having daily calls. I know it's happening. And then there's the, tr sorry Dave, were you? No, no, go ahead, please. And then there's the trust of the internal organizations. I talked a bit earlier about what to do um, with the sales prevention officers and how we have to eliminate them. You have them in your company, but they're called internal terrorists when they're in your company. The people who aren't working with you. And I think it's unfortunate because no, I don't believe anybody's gone to work to screw the organization over. I just think it's misunderstanding. Regulatory, most sales and marketing people I know call regulatory the no police, N-O, no. And that's because you come to them at the last minute and say, this is our campaign, we're launching it next Monday, can we do it? And they say, no. Regulatory are the no police, K-N-O-W. They know the rules and regulations and should be brought in six months down the line before you started even planning this campaign to say, this is the objective I want to do. 
tell me how to do it. Another one I see in a lot of companies, internal terrorists, is sales versus marketing in that they have non-aligned objectives. So marketing, you've got a new brat, you've got a new marketing director come in and he, he is heavily bonus on having a new SKU um, every six months. He's got to develop a new SKU, get one in the pipeline every six months. The sales team are being told by all the key accounts that they want range reviews, the range is over bloated, they want to kick SKUs out, they're doing range rationalization. So sales is trying to have less product on shelf, and marketing is trying to launch a new one every six months. And you wonder why there's tension and they're not singing from the same hymn sheet? Their internal terrorists are the first people you have to find long before you go out into the world and meet your sales prevention officers. David. Yeah, I think that's all very true. I mean, I really constantly am amazed when I work with clients, and obviously I mostly work directly with the marketing departments. And it amazes me how I take for granted, after all these years, I still stupidly take for granted that somehow they've passed through these filters. They've passed the idea, passed the regulatory guys or the finance guys, you know, uh, and it just blows me away how big and small organizations just can't seem to think through it's an internal let's get everybody on board let's it's almost like no no we want to keep it secret just in case they screw us um but it's if like they, a trust but but you know but but the thing is you'll do it you'll see people do it again and again and again and you go but don't you realize that you are going to get screwed if you don't do it that way right so they don't learn people just fail to learn from the experience and going back to our, our topic of change, because wh where was the motivation then to learn? If I'm getting incentivized and bonus, my, my KPIs are to launch a, a new SKU, I'm going to do it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, there's another reason why most people uh, don't go into collaborations that often is most of them fail. And I know why most of them fail, I'll share that with you in just a minute. 18 directly fail, they don't deliver on anything they were going to do. Another 15%, so that's over a third just ramble on and keep going and well, we're working with them, but it's not delivering anything. 39% are truly successful and 28% there are the gains, but nothing like you were promised at the beginning. So 61% don't really deliver what they're meant to. So why? Well, you wouldn't set up a manufacturing plant without understanding the processes, without understanding the ISOs, the international standards for manufacturing. I'm prepared to bet that of all the participants, 90% of you didn't know there was an international standard for collaboration and working. Yeah, I found, a... out, I found out when you told me the other day. So, yeah. <laughs> And it follows a process and people of what we should be doing. And it starts off, most people go to the uh, bottom right hand corner, find the right partner. No, 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 no. Start at the top. Understand your business. Are you the sort of business with the right values, leadership that wants to collaborate? And the answer for a lot of companies is no. You don't really want to collaborate. Well, if you don't really want to collaborate, don't. Don't try and force it because that's why a lot of them fail. They're in it for themselves. Um, then what is the strategy? What, what, do, what is it we're trying to do? What are the outcomes we're looking for? And then an audit inside your company. What skills are we missing? How do we develop this? And then start looking for partners who can fill the gaps. It doesn't start with a partner. It starts with your leadership and your values. Then set up joint uh, programs uh, of when you are working together and then look at value. And I'll look at value in a minute. Value is fa fairly always um, very narrowly defined and it shouldn't be when, you, when you're looking at a collaboration. Uh, and then keep, keep looking at it, keep look, um, reinvesting in it, revisiting it. And then finally, and this is the one that always makes people go, what, really? Uh, work out your exit strategy before you go into the partnership, before you go into collaboration. And people say, why would you do that? Well, the time to do it is at the beginning. So, you know, we're going to stop this collaboration when, you know, we've achieved our objectives. Uh, the marketplace has significantly changed or something goes wrong. The time to have the argument or the discussion is before you start it not when you're in the middle of a divorce. Because all of those of you who've gone through divorces know when you're splitting up and who gets what suddenly becomes very heated and fractious. 
that set out at the beginning. Who who owns the IP on this wonderful app you've developed to get people to take your product? So what, you're, owns... so what you're saying is write the prenup before you get the result. Yes. yes. Write the prenup before the divorce. Yeah. Before Very you good. decide to get married. This is yours. This is mine. Uh, but it's also a people thing. Um, there are lots of processes, uh, and the, uh, the wheel was very process-driven, but it's a people thing. If your business and the senior people in your business are traditional transactional people, uh, and then they're in their comfort zone, they don't want to collaborate, they don't want to change. What you want are innovative, strategic people, and I saw a question, and we will get back to it, is all this short-term or long-term? If it's strategic and collaboration should be strategic and long term, not just to get you out of the hole you're in. And that's why a lot of them fail is, oh, I'm in deep doo doo. How do I get out of this? I know they can help us out of it. And then we'll shaft them as soon as we're over it. I've worked on projects where we pretended we were collaborating with another company. And six months later, um, we were dishing the dirt on them and trying to put them out of business. That wasn't a good collaboration. Um, the objectives are joint objectives. You will have your objectives, they will have their objectives, but you should have a set of joint objectives that are right for this collaboration. Not for all time, not for all the businesses, but for this collaboration, if you've set your objectives correctly, what are the joint objectives and how do we get on with it? Value is really interesting. I said it tends to be fined as in the top right hand corner. It's about revenue growth or profitability, but it might be about access to resources. It's certainly coming up will be access to technology because you guys can't do it from your businesses what the world needs. It might be breaking into new markets. It's really difficult to break into a new market on your own. It might be continuity of workload or, or processes that you need help with or new uh, innovation of processes. I, I'm working with a company at the moment who has an innovative way of delivering um, OTC medicines. That's great, but they need to work and collaborate with a company who has brands that can bring this to market. No good sitting there on their own with a, most good ideas aren't lost because they're, they're bad ideas. They're lost because they don't know who to work with and how to get those ideas delivered. Exactly. I showed you this earlier thing that from Havas that scared me. 70% um, of the content provided by healthcare brands isn't meaningful, but they did look at what was meaningful. And um, so less than half is functional and be honest with ourselves isn't what that what 90 percent of our marketing is my product faster than your product my product's more soluble than your product my product lasts longer than your product we might dip into personal stuff you know this will give you peace of mind with your headache we rarely talk about collective but you put the collective and personal together the mission what's your purpose in life that's actually more important to consumers now than what the hell you do the fact that you get rid of my headache is hygiene. That's what you are. You're a headache tablet. You bloody well should get rid of my headache. I will make my decision on other factors. And um, we've sort of moved away from that, certainly in Western Europe, and I think around the world, we've become so obsessed with symptom solution marketing. And we've been told, I remember being told 15 years ago, that this wasn't suitable anymore. And yet we're still doing it. Uh, mostly we'll be familiar with the global goals and um, I mentioned that, you know, and Greta Thunberg, 14 years old, started them. And the world is moving to this. It's having a purpose. And I don't disagree with any of them. I think they're all wonderful. I think there's a huge mistake with this, which I'll share with you. So we've got number one's no poverty. Number 10 is reduced inequalities. It starts at the wrong place. Because number 17 is collaborate. And you're not going to stop poverty, world hunger, problems with water, inequality on your own. You're going to have to collaborate with governments, with NGOs, with private organizations. For healthcare brands, the biggest collaboration you can ever do, and I see it so rarely, is with patient groups, with people who suffer from the condition you claim to be trying to treat or help. They're almost an afterthought at the end. Oh, yeah, what, what's the migraine society think about this? So. All the goals are great, but start with collaboration. Work out what your purpose is. Work out what your benefit to the planet is and work out how you can collaborate with them. And all these NGOs and governments and organizations will be more than happy to help you. And you will be able to put on your brand um, you know, sustainably caught fish for your omega-3s, etc. But you have to start with a collaborative mindset 
not develop the product and then think, who the hell can we get to endorse this? Because you've started at the wrong end. Some brands are already there. Let's be honest, Dove started this a long time ago, talking about the bodies. They, they, they went away from the beautiful bodies, which every other uh, cosmetic company was doing. And they're doing this now, what people look like after they've worn a mask, a COVID mask for 18 hours in a surgery. They're talking real lives, real people. And I think, if you, I've certainly noticed, I don't know in your markets, that the tone of marketing has got a lot softer during the crisis. It's not so strident, not so bombastic. It's we're all in this together. Let's try and be nice. Let's try and do something uh, with and for each other. Competition is wasteful. Collaboration saves resources. Um, I've worked with a number of companies and I say, look, if you work with this company, you will grow the pie by X amount. Well, they say, yeah, but if we grow it by X amount, our competitors will get some as well. I say, yes, but if the size of the prize is 100 and you currently have 50% of it and you make the size of the prize 1000 and you still have 50% of it, you're doing bloody well. But so many marketeers, and I, it, it will again go back to the KPIs of what they're based on. Do I have more market share? I'd rather have the same market share of a massively expanding market than grow my market share by 2% of a static market. And if you look at most OTC sectors, the majority of them are flat. They have not been particularly healthily because we're competing with each other and consumers don't get any more headaches because you say you're fast. They'll just look at it and chose what they always chose or they'll switch, but the market won't grow. We have to find new ways of collaborating to bring in people who aren't taking painkillers, who aren't doing the behaviors we want. So collaboration works across the piece. There's a couple of collaborations I liked and ones I didn't. So, you know, sensible collaboration um, in, in the English speaking world. Uh, cups of tea are very famous. I'm one of the few Brits you'll meet who never drinks tea. Uh, but cold and flu remedies, we all tend to make them lemon flavored and acidic flavors. Um, Lipton's tea flavor. If I want a hot drink and it's comforting, well, I have a flu, fine. Tissues linked up with uh, Vicks. People are going to blow their nose. Vicks is famous for its, its inhalation stuff. So tissues with Vicks inhalation make sense. Some of them make sense, but are more challenging, I think. You're cleaning up with Kleenex for tissues. I, I fear that's a challenge too far, but it'd be interesting. Uh, and if you look at the equation for change, which I introduced earlier, um, it's also the equation for collaboration. What's the vision? What are the skills? What are the incentives? What are the resources? And what's the action plan to make this collaboration work rather than just going into it blind? Yeah. Final thing on collaboration. Um, everyone said we need to work together in a crisis and we've seen it in the crisis. The thing I've noted is that the companies that were already collaborating before the crisis have continued to collaborate and come out of it far earlier and far stronger than those that were forced into it. So if for no other reason, start thinking about collaborations now before the next crisis, because there's one coming. I don't know what it is, but there's another crisis coming. So if you've got a collaborative partnership, if you've got a number of collaborative partnerships, whether it's in the supply chain with retailers, wherever that is, if you're already working well together, because we know once this started, a number of supply chains fell apart. A number of retailers took the opportunity to gouge customers, uh, consumers as much as they could. That doesn't happen if you've already got this collaborative thing um, set up. I mentioned it's a global standard. I won't go through that. Um, it's a, a global standard that's spreading. So all these countries have got institutes for collaborative working um, and they're growing. I think Russia's just about to launch one. Conclusion, and then we'll do the questions. Um, you're gonna have to change. The consumers are changing, the markets change. Healthcare professionals and consumers don't want the world the way it was, and we can't deliver on the new world on our own. So we're gonna to have to collaborate. So change and collaboration are with us. You need to understand how to do it, because there are rules and, and, and systems uh, like everywhere else. It's just most of us don't know about them. If you wanna know more about either, contact the tra uh, Consumer Healthcare Training Academy. But now let's get to some of your questions, which I'll make Dave answer, I think. <laughs> as a test if I was listening. I think you make a really good point right there at the end, Trevor, which is what you've actually shown us is there's actually a lot of systemization, uh, uh, ways to go about change and collaboration. An awful lot of organizations, a lot of, a lot of individuals 
think they have to discover it all themselves. Um, and I think with a bit of homework and a bit of consulting and a bit of training, you can tap lots and lots of experience. Um, I did, I, I'm just gonna read one of the questions. Um, so Abhijit uh, wrote this question that, my question is, given the pace of change and the future being uncertain, and we certainly live in very changing times, or we like to think we're living in very changing times, what, according to you, will be the change in classic strategy choices, which generally stays for three to five years? What changes should change on how you write strategy and how do you build flexibility in this time of change? I think the biggest change we'll see in healthcare is, if you remember at the beginning, I showed um, the spectrum of, of health behaviors. I think it's gonna go so much far to the left of self-care that we won't recognize the self-care industry in five years. I, I think the move from treatments um, to prevention is gonna grow. If I look at the portfolios of a lot of the big, including Reckitt's, GSK, Johnson & Johnson, if I look at their portfolios, they're largely in treating illnesses. So I think we'll see the growth of a lot of smaller companies who are about prevention. I think we'll see, because also there's a global shortage of healthcare professionals. Um, I saw a device recently in a pharmacy uh, where you, they could, it was remote health, telehealth, and you could listen to your heartbeat, they can measure your blood pressure, your, your, your tidal volume of your lungs, um, and then the pharmacist would be next door with a prescription. So I think we'll see a lot of one-stop shops for healthcare. But the biggest one will be people are far more interested in the health and far more taking control of the health. And yeah, I, 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 I think service. that's the point. I think that's a, the, my, my answer to this question is, is, first of all, I'm never too sure that things change as fast as we think they're changing. But the other thing is that, as I said before, I think what's happened in this last six months is an awful lot of things the new normal isn't so much new, it's things we expected to happen, it's just happened a lot faster than we thought. Um, and so I think one of the things is that companies, instead of reacting as they quite often do, just need to put a little bit more thought into looking at what is the trend that's going on and that is slowly building and how to stay ahead of that work curve. I mean, to your point, about healthcare and about our taking care of ourselves, or you've got to look at the growth of the wellness industry, right? Which is, wellness has become a super trendy word in the last four or five years. But if you look at that broad industry, it's growing at an average of about eight to 10% a year, year on year for the last 15 years. It's now something like a, a six, seven billion dollar, a trillion dollar industry. So it just goes without saying, a lot of people are willing to pay money for wellness. And that means the keeping yourself in great shape, keeping yourself healthy, keeping yourself really well and looking forward to the future. Um, and so, but you can see that with a lot of other trends as well. And I think one of the things is that maybe too many organizations don't actually follow the trends. They react to stuff that happens today, right? Instead of investing a little bit more time in that portal. I couldn't agree more, Dave. I think what the COVID current crisis has done, it's not catapulted us into a future. It's dragged us from a future we've been talking about for six years and made people realise they've now got, they've had three months to fix that. Where had they been, exactly to your point, looking at what the trends have been done. The trends have been talking about self-care, digital and monitoring for 10 years. At least. And the consumer healthcare industry has said, yeah, that's really interesting and done nothing with that information. Not all of it. There are some outstanding examples out there of, of, of linking things together. Um, but that's the other thing I think will become um, more interesting is the term holistic and linking everything together. It will be a holistic journey. It will be holistic healthcare. I won't just think about my headache and rush to buy, the, buy my Nurofen. I'll work out why I get headaches. I'm not drinking enough. And so I'll go to the, again to wellness and hydrate more. I think yeah. people are going to take more care about their whole health and the whole healthcare system will respond to that by where you get your healthcare. And I think we've seen, we're beginning to see the decline of health places, hospitals, pharmacies. This will all be integrated into where I live. I want health where I am. I don't want so health. To your point you as before, if you look at, look at insurance companies, 
and in recent years, the way, if you look at the, the messaging that insurance companies are putting out, more and more, it's about being prepared. They are really on board with the wellness movement. They're really well on board with the mobile and the video and the digital medicine movements. So you have uh, Ping An, the biggest, I think the biggest medical insurance company in China, now has these stations in major cities where it looks like the old fashioned phone box and you go in there and you do a self checkup in there. Um, or you can do it, you know, as you say, over your phone. Uh, there's more and more facilities in doing that. Now, insurance companies are really behind this for obvious reasons, because they love to reduce the chances you are going to get sick and make a claim. But that's an interesting thing, because when I then talked to, on behalf of when I was doing the work of writing a marketing strategy for one of the world's biggest health insurance companies, but we went and talked to pharmacists in Hong Kong about, they had no idea what the insurance companies were doing. They had no idea that the insurance companies were actually encouraging this. Now, that was the fault on both parties. Uh, if you think about it, a natural collaboration would be the insurance companies going to the pharmacists and trying to do something with them to help them raise awareness amongst their customers and go and use, because the insurance companies have these massive databases of available information, which again, maybe they could do a better job of making that more easy to reach or easy to understand and bring people together, if you like. Yeah, the, 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 this use, intelligent use of apps. I mean, the insurance companies in the States have for a number of years now offered discount if, you're, if, if they've got some metrics to measure your exercise with. And, you know, every action has the law of unintended consequences. So we know of people who put their, their Fitbit or their Apple Watch on the dog's collar and let the dog go off to show they've been doing, uh, doing that. But Germany recently allowed app health apps to be prescribed by healthcare professionals. There are some apps that they can say this is available on the state and we'll provide some apps for you. Yeah. So this whole thing of um, I'm, I'm, I'm not an illness, um, I'm a person who happens to have, uh, I had to teach myself and I probably failed it very early on in, in this webinar to stop saying I'm a diabetic and start saying I have type 2 diabetes. I'm not going to be defined by it. And uh, soon, and labeling theory is really interesting. It's, I, I have this condition. When you, it's, like, it's like asthma. asthma. If you say I'm asthmatic, people immediately say, oh, you can't run, you're a wheezy, feeble kid. If you say I currently have asthma, again, it's a reframe and it totally changes people's behavior to you. Oh, how do you manage it? Or I'm managing asthma. And I, I, I think this is going to grow. People will no longer be defined by their conditions. I mean, today in England, we have a hundred year old man uh, going to the Queen to get a knighthood today. Yes. for walking a hundred laps of his house during uh, Colonel Major Tom uh, since the lockdown. Uh, we're living older, we're redefining our lives in the way we want. And that's going to mean we want to live longer, weller. And so we're going to start looking at ourselves as a person and diet and skin. I think probiotics are going to play a huge part. I don't think we truly understand um, what our intestinal flora and our skin flora actually does for our health. So that was a very long answer to a very short, easy question. Where, uh, what do I think the futures are going to be? But uh, I think it's healthcare. Yeah, sorry. Aang, do you have another yes. question? Yes, we got some questions. Hi. Um, a question from Vernon. Is change driven by short terminism and quarterly reporting? Can we not learn from North Asia where they have stronger understanding? Yeah. Let's go for both of you. I'll say my piece. I think most businesses use change for short term and to fix things. Yeah. Um, I don't think um, there's anybody in many companies, um, it sort of goes to our earlier question, is look at what the trends are. What have we got to change to be ahead of the trend? It's, oh God, this happens. How can we fix it quickly? And at the senior level, their KPIs drive that behavior. I've seen it time and time again. Um, you know, I've known companies who stock load um, in their cold and flu because a lot of companies are so dependent on the cold and flu season. They stock load for three months before the cold and flu season. There's a bad season and then they have no sales for the three months after it. It's short termism um, profits this month, this quarter, not what's good for the long term uh, growth of this business. So I do think they change because of short term. Dave. Yeah, I well, knowing Vernon and knowing he and I have the experience of many years in China and then mine in Japan, 
I know what he's talking about, which is a different mindset where the Wall Street quarterly results call drives a lot of business behaviors and the need to launch products, for example, uh, as opposed to having a longer term view of like what you're trying to do, having a longer term view of what really needs to change about your own organization, for example. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think has been interesting right now is because a lot of companies have problems at the moment uh, because of sales, because of COVID. And so we have that automatic reaction of, well, we must cut talent. Um, now it's interesting because in the HR world now, you don't talk about employees, you talk about talent, but that's until you want to get rid of them. And then it's, then it's, <laughs> then they're not so talented. Um, <laughs> and I think that's a real bugbear of mine that uh, I've seen too many companies willing to cut out the brains trust that will help them get over the humps of both short and long-term problems. Um, experience does count. Um, and I don't mean as somebody that's been around for years, but I just mean somebody that has done the homework and it understand what's really going on and has thought about what the potential changes are. Aim, do you have another you. one? Yes, please. Um, although the changes needed in OTC are substantial, as you have clearly outlined, Trevor, and um, there are just some marketing basics that are being missed, agility being the key one. As an example, the sleep aid sector. Um, COVID-19 caused real problems with sleep, anxiety, and stress. Yet, in the first months of the pandemic, no UK sleep aid brand had any campaign or even website materials related to COVID-19 and how their product might support people through short-term sleep problem. No sponsor ASMR videos, no sponsor tracks on the Calm app. What do you think is stopping this type of short-term tactical marketing that has worked so well for beauty and wellness brands? It's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I'll have a shot then you, Dave. I think one of the problems, especially with sleep aid, sleep aid is really interesting, um, is marketers tend to define the market by the data they buy. So this is what the data said the sleep aid market is. So it's Nitol, it's Calms, it's them. Go on Amazon and look at sleep aids. Uh, tablets are the small part of it. There's vibrating pillows, there's oxygen stuff. We look at the market in what we think is the market and that's just not how consumers look at it. So for, the, for consumers who have been trouble sleeping during the COVID, most of them will not have ended up with a pharmacological um, solution. They'll have gone somewhere else because they, in their desire to look after themselves, to explore possible solutions, will have looked at all solutions, not just the ones that interest us. And I think that's what holds us back a lot. We're so obsessed with our market share, our numbers, how we define the market. And that, that's a marketing insight. It's not a consumer insight. Yeah, I, that's a really good point, which is we talk about category management. And, you know, in different industries, I'm always fascinated because people define their category in a very limited way. So to your point, sleep aid, well, actually air conditioning units are sleep aid. You know, uh, and so air conditioning companies have been very good at figuring out, well, putting it, putting things that fed through your air conditioning to help you sleep, particular, even the particular smells, etc. We've seen that in different marketplaces. Who are you competing against is quite often, I think, the biggest single barrier to change, uh, where brands or manufacturers don't really understand who they really, they think they are a pharmacological sleep aid, and that's the category. No, 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 I can't sleep is the category. So anything that can help people sleep is a competitor, but it's also an opportunity for collaboration, for doing things with them, et cetera. And I, I see this over and again and again in so many categories. But I also think on that particular question, one of the issues, you know, the, the, you can argue that beauty business was pretty quick to take advantage of the COVID situation. And we, I could talk endlessly about examples about lipstick sales uh, in COVID and why they've done so well. But one of the other things is that the pharma industry itself tends to be uh, reticent uh, about jumping, about moving quickly. 
uh, just because I think it sort of sees itself as being, no, 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 but that's just, that's beauty play. That's FMCGs. We're not FMCGs. We are, uh, you know, something more worthy. And so we're going to take our time and figure this out. And of course, it doesn't really work that way. You know, the world doesn't work that way. People don't think about that that way. They just want a solution straight away. So they will look for the option. Thank you. Um, we got time for one more question. If you've got time, we've got time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The last question is, given that we have all gone through huge enforced change these last few months, do you expect that they will stay with many of the changes they have experienced? For example, more health and wellness focused, um, more compliant to their, you know, um, taking medications or supplements, or do more exercise? I saw, yeah. I saw a report by McKinsey last week uh, that said, um, of, they asked that very question, which of the new behaviors you've got do you think will last after the COVID? Uh, online shopping was the biggest one, and telemedicine and buying healthcare products online was the, was the second and third. So I yeah. think those behaviors will last. Maybe yeah. not at the peak they are at the moment, but I think they're gonna last. Yeah, I think, I think that what we're gonna see is there's been this speeding up, but there's also been a chance at a time for ingraining habits. Um, and I, you know, I lived in SARS during, during uh, in Hong Kong during the SARS period. We had all the same issues, but it only lasted a few weeks. So we made some changes, but before it got ingrained as habit, hey, we moved on. This is like, for most of us, it's three, four, five, six months, uh, and it's going to keep on going on. So yes, but I think certainly Trevor's right. Anything to do with the way people shop has probably changed. Health habits had probably changed in terms of self-aware and self-care. And we've got ourselves into those sorts of things. And I will remind people of something I said on one of these earlier sessions, cooking. The, the, the change in the way in which we've spent more time at home thinking about our food or watching cooking, programming, or trying to figure out how to make a salad, etc., will have created more of an awareness about better intake uh, that will change, has changing a lot of way, the way people will think about their health in the future. So, Thank I you. think we're at the end, right? Yes. Thank that, you. Was great, that was great, Trevor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I think um, I would like to say thank you for both of you for your time and very insightful information, Trevor and Dave. And I would like to introduce our next um, webinar that will be on the 7th of August. Um, under the topic of from the consumer journey to the guided experience, unlocking critical moment of care. From um, Hello Health, <coughs> we got Graham Reed and Chris Carr. So uh, please stay tuned. We will invite all, all of you by LinkedIn. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Wayne, you. for everything you did and Emma and all, all the people at the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy. Thank you for all your help. Thank you. Thank you. And have a lovely Friday. Have a day. Stay well. Okay. Stay well, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.